But today we are here to attend the talk by Professor Tobias Jemek, so uh, from uh, Aachen University in Germany. So talking about time domain computing fundamentals and prospects. So uh, Professor Tobias Jemek is a uh, heading of the chair of the Integrated Digital Systems and Secret Design at the Aachen University, Germany. After many years in industry, his research focuses today on next generation computer architectures, combining novel electronic devices. Uh, his research focuses today the next generation computing architects, combining novel electronic devices and new computing paradigm. The underlying quantitative exploration uses fast prototyping based on a proprietary FPGA cluster called Neuro ALX. Uh, overall, his research is embedded in two larger cluster prospect projects, Neurotech and NeuroSys, that bring together industrial and academic experts in the field of algorithm design, hardware engineering, and neuroscience to design novel computing systems. So thank you very much, Professor Tobias, to, for accepting our invitation. And uh, the floor is with you to start your talk. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. And hello to everybody around the world. Uh, let's see what uh, we'll uh, learn today. I mean, uh, it will be about time domain computing. But before I start my speech, I mean, I just wanted to uh, give you a quick view where we are right now. I mean, it's somewhere here up on the third floor. I mean, we have a sunny day. It's not an actual figure, but uh, really have nice weather today. And also upcoming tomorrow, we have even heat wa warning. So it's also nice to be here in Aachen. It's <laughs> something to keep in mind. Aachen, well placed in Germany, Western, most Western point in Germany. But anyway, that, that is background. These are details. Let's look into the exciting domain of time domain computing. So to dive into that, the first point is, I think, certainly to locate time domain computing. And I want to do that in a way to think of a classification that, I mean, was done a couple of years back where you say you have one distinct domain. The one is the analog domain and the other one is the digital domain. We are very well aware of what analog computing I mean, is good for, and people are, again, suggesting that for the many computations, com computa computa computational intensive operations we have in the artificial neural networks. So it can be done in those cases very area and energy efficient. So that's a, a great plus for that. However, I mean, as people have assessed that already in the past, there's a certain trade off of the cost you have to pay to do computation, the analog domain, and the signal to noise ratio that you can achieve, right? As uh, opposed to signal to noise ratio, you can also think of um, representation in bits if you talk about digital computing. And you can see that somewhere in the range of eight bits in the digital domain, and that is then corresponding to an appropriate SNR in the analog domain, you see this crossover point. And you see that it becomes more and more expensive to still be as accurate in the analog domain until you get to barrier where it's simply not technical feasible or unreasonable in terms of cost that you have to invest. I mean, size and energy and area that uh, comes in there. So there's also the challenge of technology scaling. You have to do a redesign typically going from one node to the next. You have to do, you have to have really advanced, highly skilled designers to do that. And the other aspect that people worry about a lot is this interfacing circuitry. Right? You do analog computations. It's very energy efficient and maybe very small. But then you have to go back to the digital domain and this going back and forth. That's really where energy or efficiency is lost in this case. You can go to uh, the different domain on the opposing here side. That's a digital domain. And that is its beauty. I mean, its efficiency by largely being supported and automated with EDA support. And technology scaling, I mean, is something that, yeah, one has to think about it, but I mean, a major part is taken over by the EDA tools, simply redesigning well, resynthesizing, doing place and route, and being more or less done in that new technology node. Apparently, there's also some crossovers already where you can do clocked analog, which is, it's not digital, but you discretize the clock, right? And you can also think of, I mean, getting more analog from the digital domain and not having a synchronized clock, having asynchronous circuits. However, at least this one in the digital domain is, I mean, a niche application, really. You see that for some security chips being done in commercial products. 
Now, if one now thinks about what can, I mean, time domain computing bring is, well, it has the benefit of also exploiting something in the analog domain and its related benefits. And that is to use the time as the reference, as encoding the value as the arrival time of an edge in time. At the same time, the signaling happens in full swing, like we are used in the digital domain. That is, we have not really any issues of doing technology scaling or voltage scaling, right? There's no limitations to that. As a, I mean, a transition, that's something digital can do very well, and we can use standard tools, more or less, to also do that, redesign quickly in a new technology. However, I mean, we spend a lot of effort in the digital domain to make sure we keep synchronized. We put in margins to account for all those variations, systematic and random variations. So those, they are not filtered out on a cycle by cycle basis, like we have that in the digital synchronous design, but as time is an analog signal here, we suffer from those variations. So that's something we look into later as one of the challenges if you go for time domain computing. One can now also kind of compare that a little bit in the architecture. People like to talk a lot about computing in memory. And this is kind of, I mean, a classic example, right? You do your multiplication maybe on a bit cell level. You have some way of encoding then the multiplication result on a voltage level, for example, on the bit line. You accumulate on the bit line. It's a very cheap analog operation in that sense. And then all you have to do is to do the back conversion into a discrete values at the end. There are similar ideas that people now try to do to merge digital well, computations into a memory and still compute in a digital fashion. I mean, there was this TSMC paper two years ago where they put all the full letters more or less into their memory, which is a nice example of also applying computing in memory in the digital domain. Now, looking into the well, time domain, how is that different? Well, it, again, it looks very similar, right? You have a chain of computational elements. And I mean, this is just aggregating from top to bottom, right? So it's a, well, more similar if you want to the analog structure. And the question apparently then is how does it compare in terms of efficiency? And that's something we'll look into at the very last slide. Now, time domain computing is the, the name I like to use for it. I mean, I, I did some search and tried to figure out what's the proper technical term. And, and looking in papers, there's many variants that you can find and they all talk about more or less the same thing. Anyway, in the context of this talk, we'll stick to time domain computing to not make it too complicated. So what is involved if you talk about time domain computing? Well, we, again, start off by thinking that we start in a digital domain, right? Values are stored or communicated typically in a digital fashion. We want to make sure that those values are precise. We can store it. We can communicate that. Now, starting the digital domain, you have to have something that converts from the digital value into the time domain. So if so we have a digital to time converter, or sometimes also called time encoder. We do then the computations in the time domain. When you're done with the computation, we finally convert back into the digital domain. So this is kind of a little bit similar if one looks at those blocks to an analog computing, where you have a digital to analog converter and an analog to digital converter at the end. So if one thinks that these circuits I mean half a certain price, one also has to worry about how to I mean what the cost of that is in the time domain. So we want to look a little bit deeper into those blocks in the talk. I mean, again, just as a clarification, I mean exemplification. If one thinks in digital domain, what do we have? We have, for example, an 8-bit bus, and then each cycle we toggle those wires, those eight wires and they might all be switching. Now, the benefit in the time domain is we have only a single switching event, right? As opposed to eight wires, there might be only a single wire that switches, and that gives us far less dynamic power, right? So that's the idea, the concept, and where one expects to get the benefit of doing the time domain computing. Apparently, if you go back into the digital domain, you're back to the many wires and the related cost of dynamic power consumption. Apparently, one can also try to do I mean, communication with that, but I mean, I think purely in the computation part, also there you have so many wires. If you think about an error, the carry, the save, uh, the sum and all of that, I mean, here you just have this one signal, right? So that's really the benefit in the dynamic power. The first paper that really proposed this time domain computing goes back to 2013, where it was shown that the time domain computing can be nicely employed to do LDPC decoding. Right, and they compared at that time, Yashita, the um, well, a reference digital implementation to an 
computation in the time domain and i mean the the benefit or the I mean, the glaring in their eyes, there was kind of this part down here where, I mean, those computations, they could be done so much more efficiently in time domain, so it looked extremely promising. What you can see, there's almost nothing left. However, if you think about doing the sum, well, you have to do a lot of these uh, digital to time conversions, also the back conversions, and you can see that they add a lot, right, to the overall cost bill. But still, overall, there was a significant reduction from the original reference design going to the time domain computing, despite the incurred overhead doing these conversions. Now, this is one example. The other one I found really interesting that I mean came up in 2018 was to actually realize a neuromorphic accelerator also to uh, doing time domain computing. Now, why is that so exciting? Well, the one thing we know about how the brain operates is that at least some of the information is also encoded in time. We have those spikes that communicate well, information between different neurons, but it's also the relationships between the rival time of spikes that have a very important aspect there. So employing then time domain computing also to do circuits that are more similar, more similar operating like the brain, I think that's really exciting. And I hope we can see more of that and show and how well that works. Maybe it even feeds back to the neuroscientists that they might better understand of what the brain or how the brain actually computes. Talking about computing, I mean, the question now is how can we do computations in time domain? That's what I wanna cover now in the next upcoming slides. The long range signaling, first of all, seems to be simple. You just have your, your step function, you have a single wire that sounds wonderful. However, the one challenge is that you somehow have to know where in time are you. So you always have to kind of have a reference signal, right? And the, the matching between those can be challenging, especially if you think about long range signaling. Uh, then we have the, the arithmetic computations, linear computation and the nonlinear functions. Both of them will be covered now upcoming. So let's look at the first aspect. I mean, how do we add something in a time domain? Well, it's as simple as adding a delay, right? You have your input edge coming on one side, you add the delay element, the output has this additional value incurred, accumulated. So you pass just your arising edge along your blocks and you do the addition just if you want on the fly. Beautiful aspect. If you think about multiplication, there's again different ways of doing that. But one way that is rather straightforward is to think, well, if I want to multiply a result, well, I could scale, if you think all values, for example, at the beginning or the end in the algorithm. So what I can do in the time domain is either when I do the digital to time conversion to consider a certain I mean, time step scaling, or I do that in the back conversion. So all my increments in time steps, they follow a certain time scale. And if I change that time scale by that corresponding factor, then I implicitly, with that back conversion, I do my multiplication, which is a, then a simple way of realizing that multiplication. Now, if I add two numbers and it's a constant number, it's a little bit boring. So what we really like to do is we want to add a variable delay. And that is also another way of doing the multiplication by having partial products created. And then you add them up in a shift and add fashion. So having a, a variable adder, a variable delay adder, you can also realize any multiplication if you chain them up. Right, so the question is now, how can you realize such a variable delay? And I would like to go back here to the original proposal by Miyashita. So what they did is kind of this circuit. And if you try to understand of input slope coming in and A and B and how they are switching, it is a little bit cumbersome with those inversions. So what I did is, I mean, let's get rid of those inversions, right? So we have then two OR gates and an AND gate. Let's clean it a little bit up. Now the circuit, I think, is much easier to understand. What you can see is uh, we have an end gate here. So for a slope to kind of propagate through this OR gate, the other input should be high. And you can now easily see if D in is equals to zero and the, the A signal will then be always a one, right? D in is zero, we get a high signal. So the A will always be one. So as soon as here our input comes in, the B will be toggling like you can see, depending on the input and then we get the corresponding output switching high as well. Now, if you have the other case that D in is equals to one, so the input to the OR gate will be zero. So A will start with, with being a zero value. 
Now we wait again for the slope coming in. B will toggle, but it has no input yet on the output because of the end gate. We have to wait for the signal to propagate through the OR gate. So two identical gates, uh, same increment in delay. And then we have our delay element that then I mean represents our delay value. Right? And now selecting whether we go through the upper and the lower path, that's our way of how we can configure the delay of our element and then have our variable delay element implemented. The one aspect to keep in mind is that the circuit shown here, it works as indicated with a rising input edge. If you think about a falling input edge because of that end gate, the output will already fall. Right, so for the falling input edge, you have not the possibility to actually have different delays. It will always be the min delay. Right, so it works only on one edge. And that is kind of an, an aspect one could think about or reason about. Like you, you have that double edge um, flip-flops that you trigger on both edges. That way you can cut your power by half right? because you only need half as many transitions. And that's then what one could do as well um, when one employs those dual edge operation right, to realize in the circuit. But you make sure that these delays are same if you have a rising or falling edge, then you can use a double edge operation. So the principle otherwise we have seen on the prior slide is we have a delay that we select or we don't select. To realize that in a chain, one can do that either in a logarithmic fashion that your delays are powers of two, which then gives you only a logarithmic number of stages to encode the number, or you have this linear chain and then you max one out of those taps to I mean realize your delay. All the trade-off between those two I mean this is less power, less stages. You have more switching activity. On the other side, here if you have uh, different delay times this element, you might have challenges of having really linear steps, right? If you have a linear chain on the right-hand side, having linear increments is much easier to be realized. All right, so what do we have? It's these two alternatives. We can have this, I mean, logarithmic delays added, which is then, I mean, more compact, more energy efficient, or we have, I mean, a corresponding higher number in this linear chain realized. Now, this is based on the simple idea, a simple idea like a real digital design. We have a gate that has a delay. We can just insert that and we get this delay, right? And it can be done completely in a digital flow. There's apparently other ideas to do it as well, right? And the one way is to change the capacitance, right? You could think of having the loading being changed. Also, a load capacitance, something that can very well be done in a digital flow, assess the timing delay you get due to that. However, if you change the cap, if you enlarge that, we know that C is again part of our power equation. So increasing C will increase the power. So your I mean, power demand, your power usage will be depending on what you actually compute. On the other side, resistance is not part of our dynamic power, right? So we can play with the resistance without having any impact there. And that's the other idea. And there's then many ways of having resistance being added. It can just be a, an RC tank, so you have the R in the path that you change, or you could do that in the transistor stack that you have additional devices, or you could use memristive devices being added in the stack, then also incur different driving strengths, and that way you have a different R if you want so um, from the supply rail to the output. A last option that I've found is uh, you could also think about changing the bulk some overhead right to address and connect to the bulk but anyway it's uh, would be another way of changing the threshold voltage and then again changing the speed and thereby having variable delays uh, realized now if you talk to analog designer they are quick to say why not have a well, constant or a, a specific current source that's what they like to think of right you have a, a specific current you can tune and with that current you have then a linear relationship and the time it takes to charge up to a specific threshold and also with that way you can apparently um, realize uh, such elements of different delay now what we spoke about so far is ways to realize those different delays right that, that is okay that is fine However, we have not spoken about how to realize negative numbers, right? And the one way to do that is binary offset coding. While it's a classic way of how you can re recode numbers, number representation, basic idea, you have a reference that offset that you are always in the middle. And then per, depending on the delay on the other edge, you then are either a negative addition or a positive addition to your result you had so far. You have to have this additional reference path. So you have two paths to realize that. 
but the reference paths you have to have anyway at the end to do your back conversion. Now, other principles to do positive and negative numbers, you can split that, have a path only for the positive, you accumulate that, only for the negative, accumulate that, compare at the end, or yet another idea would be to pick a pulse, and then if you want to increase the positive number, you increase the, the negative side of the pulse, right? You go up, you go down again, you delay the falling edge of the pulse, larger number, you delay the rising edge, negative number, and at the end, you look at the pulse width, another option of doing signed numbers. Now, with that basic linear algebra or arithmetic, we can move on to nonlinear function. And that is what I've shown before, LDPC, where it was really good about. And that is, for example, minimum finding. It's just an OR gate, right? The first one that comes, I mean, is the winner. So you have the minimum. Maximum, you use an AND gate. Beautiful. Extremely simple. However, only works for one of the two edges. Then a compare circuit looks a little bit more complicated. You have an AND gate. Oops, sorry. No. You have, an, uh, you have a NAND gate, the A goes in, uh, bottom B goes in, both are zero at the beginning, so zero AND gate, and inversion, so the other input is a, is a one, right? And then as soon as one of the two will go high, the AND gate will trigger, making a zero on the other input, so this other input will then be correspondingly shut down, and you have then the select detecting the right signal. The only point to observe here is now that the... Oh, that's a typo, I think, that at the bottom here should be select A. I'm sorry about that. So A triggers first. Select A not should be here at the bottom. That's then neg negatively indicated that A was the first, I mean, to arrive here. All right. One can think then of how to do that multi-bit, which is, again, interesting for applications like LDPC. We just move the inversion to the input of the next gate. Now we have here select A coming together properly with the A signal. Nicely works. Now, to extend that for multi-bit operation, what we can do is we simply do select all other signals, negate that, go into the end gate, and then we can also do the same operation, finding and compare operation between A to all the others, right? That's it's very powerful, very efficient com I mean, comparison. Think of doing that digital domain. You have a whole tree of, of adders doing this, I mean, subtract operation, looking at the signs. So much more complexity, which is really easy and straightforward to realize in time domain. Absolute function, yet another one nice um, opportunity, right? You start both at the same time. You do the XOR and uh, you get out the OXOR between the pool sizes, right? So the length of the pools indicates the value. XOR between the two gives you then the, the absolute value between the two. Right? Also, uh, nice uh, realization. Okay, so that is kind of basic function as far as I wanted to introduce, introduce that here. There is then other ideas to even eliminate one step further. If you think, for example, of a sensor application, you first would go into an ADC, convert your voltage signal of your sensor into a digital signal, use the digital signal to do a digital to time conversion. Hmm, it's a lot of overhead. So why not directly go from the voltage into the time domain? Again, there's plenty of fullness of analog circuits that can translate such a voltage signal into a time delay signal. So yeah, so that's other opportunities if you think direct, uh, about direct usage in a sensor. Now, what I want to do next is dive into the other side where we've seen here at times the digital conversion that can be also quite costly. So what are the principles? What are the ideas? Again, starting very basic. You have your input coming in here after your calculation. You have another delay chain realized and you just pick up the values here and kind of look on where is my edge in that delay chain and then knowing from where that edge is, like here the data comes in, you kind of have your reference edge that signals of when to capture this input signal. And then with that reference edge, you get an output code here that two ones here are still zero, the other ones are already set to one. So you have a theometer code that you can then convert to a digital number. Right? So that, that is one way of doing that. Some people worry about having finer granular resolution and the time information. But I mean, I guess we, we increment delay, well, in the digital domain with delay elements, so we don't need a final resolution really. Anyway, if one wanted to, one can use this venue, scale, venue delay chain as a possibility to have finer steps. Let's look at a different approach now. We saw that we can have a long chain of delay elements. Watch the edge, when does it happen? And we also saw that when we did the digital to time conversion, we could do that in a linear fashion or in a logarithmic fashion. Same principle can apply for the back conversion if you're worried about the many stages, right? 
So what we have here now next, again, data comes in our reference signal that gives us our zero value. And now we compare those two. And then the same principle as we know that for ADC, the SAR principle, successive appro approximation registers apply. So depending on which one is having a larger value, we then selectively delay the other signal to kind of make those two edges to align better and better together. And then we directly get our tooth, uh, well, our binary encoding of that signal by observing of what were those setting in that chain. The one thing to keep in mind, and I mean, just to, for your attention, right, we have those two edges coming in here. We latch them or register them here in the flip-flop. Apparently, flip-flop has a, a little delay, right? So we have to wait for the flip-flop to process the data. That's why we have these weight elements bottom and top. Then we can continue with those edges because now the signal had enough time to set our, conditionally set our um, D2C uh, again, right, digital to, uh, to time converters appropriately. So then the accordingly realigned edges occur here and it continues until we have all bits decoded. Now, that is a way that works. Now, one can think of trying to do that more optimally. And that's the same principle as we saw for the signed numbers. We offset the one edge all the time, and then we only conditionally delay the other edge, right? So we have our reference, and then we kind of can do a plus minus by adding a corresponding delay only on the one line. So we cut down the conditional possibility of delaying both sides to having own, only one variable delay element here, less effort, smaller design. One can then do one step further if one doesn't like to have this variable delay being realized because it's too costly. One can have two. The one has this delay increment one wants to see. The other one is kind of a neutral delay. And we have those two. Now, how can we fix that to add delay to the right signal? Well, we just have a max to switch the two delay lines and then have either the reference signal or the data signal coming in with the, into the input that is delayed, right? And we can flip that as we want. The challenge in this case is apparently then to know on what line do we have our reference and what line is our data signal. So one has to have some extra gate to decode at the end the output, but otherwise it works the same as we have seen before. Still, we have here the weight delay because of the flip-flop, and one can think, I mean, if one worry about that back conversion to have it as short as possible latency, one can go to speculative computation. So what happens here? Well, I just realized two delays on my signal, right, on my reference signal and my data signal. And then depending on my outcome of the comparison I have, I selected appropriately already delayed signal. Right? So what I can hide here is the additional delay for that flip-flop because I do in parallel my computation. Right? I do a speculative computation, but I, as you can see, I double the amount of delays I have to realize. So it's really a trade-off between the power and energy I invest into that part where this then the latency to decode or well encode my time signal again into a digital signal. With that, we have covered uh, the main blocks to realize time domain computing. And now I want to dive a little bit into the challenges we have if we want to do such design. So far, it, it looks straightforward and maybe even simple to do that. Now, the, the three aspects to worry about is variations, linearity, and cost of conversion. Now, the bottom is already one example where you have the input value, and then you see the output of the TEC, and you, can't, you see that you can't really decode, I mean, properly, you have then for the same input value, different output values. Now here on the right hand side, some calibration happening that helps you to cover that. What one has to do then is to look into PVT variation. That would be a first step. These look rather linear, and that is again a nice part in time domain. If you shift all the delays in the same direction, that is not a problem, right? The reference is delayed accordingly. All your delays elements are delayed accordingly. So you're not sensitive really to PVT variations as long as all delays shift in the same manner, right? If you then look in the INL, you see that also there, there's not much difference between the PVT corner. So that is actually, it's a nice feature of time domain computing. You don't have to have so much headache about everything being shifted in the one or the other direction. Then there's the other aspect and that's then the random mismatch. And that is maybe more of a problem because yes, well, if you add a lot of random errors, they accumulate and then you get less and less accurate result. What we like to differentiate is cascode schemes where you have your delay elements one after the other, right? And then we have the benefit 
that if the, the noise is random, is uncorrelated, that we only have the square root out of m that is adding up here. If you have a cast code that is we stack transistors and have then different delays by the way how many transistors are active or how many are active in parallel, same story holds true there. However, and that is a key difference, differentiator between the two, if I have a cascade and I use digital kind of standard cells, they have all the same behavior. Input slope, output slope is all looking very much the same. If I have a cascade where I play with the R in the pull up and pull down path, I impact my slope at the output and that slope, like we'll see later on, will have an impact on our delay again. So one has to be a little careful with that kind of design. Now, we have systematic variations that is depending on how we design our, uh, our structure. And well, they, they might need to be placed and routed manually to make sure that everything matches nicely. So that is a lot of effort. Questions, can one do that better? We have some suggesting coming up. But anyway, we have some digital flow applied where we didn't pay too much attention to this wiring and placement. And it's true. I, uh, what you can see is that if you want to represent different numbers here in different colors, you see they overlap. So I, I don't know what number is coming out at the end. I can't set a clear boundary to say this is value one, this is value two, this is value three. Now, if one goes to a structured flow, which is supported by modern EDA tools today, one could do a first step of placing those delay cells in a very regular or well-controlled pattern, which is nice. You can see that now the, the different colors are somewhat spread apart, but you can also see that there's some, like the red one's middle in the blue, right? And the red here in, in the green, right? So it doesn't work out fully, right? However, now what was the problem? The problem was routing, right? We thought that cells directly placed, tools would be a great job, do always minimum routing and all that. But what we figured out is that you really need a very structured control way of routing to be able at the end to separate bit all, between all the values, minus one, zero, and plus one, for example, and really get an exact value at the output of your computing chain, right? So that is, I mean, what is possible using a structured approach? It still has some residual uncertainty, systematic spread. So it is repeated. It's based on the EDA tools. It's not yet measurements being done. And then the last one here I wanted to mention, slope and delay effect. I, I said that before. If you change the delay, we have here two stages that, that either are active here or only the second stage is active. So you change the drive of this cell. That means that you, end, you change the slope. So if you look now at the first stage, that can have a short or a long delay, right? That is the first stage long delay, first stage short delay. Well, that's dependency, sorry, on the, on the second stage at the end, right? So the second st stage being set up to have a short delay, right? Uh, no, nothing added. Now you see the blue curve is if the first stage also was set to short delay. However, if the first stage was set to long delay, you see you get a higher delay, right? So you're dependent with your calculation on the second stage on the value of the first stage. And that's the interdependency between your computation. That's why we believe you should have inverters between the stages to make sure to have accurate results at the end. Linearity, I mentioned that before. I mean, there's a simple way people think you could fix that. You could try to capture all values in a kind of random fashion. You see that some values are more frequent than others. And one could think of then computing back the exact values by having just the inverse transfer function at the end, and then you can, again, regenerate your linearity by having more or less a, well, it's very, it's a smart, but I mean, at the end, simple to realize way of more or less randomly or in a controlled fashion, stimulate both, I mean, sides, and then, I mean, do this histogram and counting to do your linearity. Well, you can do calibration in other means as well, and we want to look a little more in, in those effects. Again, if you don't do calibration, it's hard to differentiate the output values depending on the input you have. After calibration is another example. It is very well possible. Now, what you see here is now actually measurement results we did for those delay chain to also take a look into that. So what we have here at the top is the distribution of computing the value 400, right? It's 800 stages. There's many, many ways to compute the value 400. If you try many of those, you get kind of a Gaussian distribution for a single chain of delay elements. Now, if you look at multiple chains, and that's the different colors here, you see they are all spread around, right? You have some happening earlier, some happening later. So it's a bias depending on the chain. 
Now, if you add calibration capabilities in the chain, which we did, we could realign them to have one very tight Gaussian distribution. And with that, then one is kind of able to differentiate different numbers, right? If you look again before calibration, it is hard to differentiate and after calibration, it is, they have some overlap, right? The Gaussian distribution, right? But still the, the confusion is only, only between directly neighboring values. So it's kind of an LSB error that you add. Another aspect, this is for a single chip, chain to chain. This one is variation chip to chip. Again, same pr principle doing calibration across chips. You can put that all together to have a nice Gaussian distribution for here again for the value 400. So you can really use this circuit. Going down to lower voltages, main story you see here, it's kind of same scale. You see, well, it's not same scale. This one is even a larger scale. And you see that your spread here is much wider than up here. So one has to pay attention to that, right? Your, your sigma is getting much wider than you have that at the higher voltage. So that could be an argument to stay at higher voltage for this time domain computing. And then lastly, cost of conversion. I mean, I don't want to have here this detailed discussion on how much it costs. I'll have that comparison at the end. Um, but again, that's something to keep an eye on. One shouldn't be too happy just to, I mean, think uh, that the lower part is kind of for free. All right, talking about design consideration, automated flow, I said that is nice. It's digital design, you can do that. However, as I've shown on the prior slide, what you need, if you start with that baseline, this is random place, how you see that in digital flow, you need to get a regular structure, but even if the cells are really neighboring, that is not sufficient. What you have to have is regular placement and then these, I mean, routing templates that can be adapted to a certain degree, and then you are able to get this nice tight distribution and really compute proper values. There's other aspect, I mean, sharing this reference chain, you can do the bit split technique is something I'll show where you can handle uh, eight bits, uh, compute that in single bit delays. One can do a trade-off between accuracy and the throughput. That is, again, um, something to think about in time domain. If you want to be very accurate, you can have really large delays, so little variation doesn't matter. You compute extremely precise, but you wait forever to be done with your computation. So you push the delays closer together, but then you feel and see that variation, right? And then that's this trade-off where you can say, I can be faster, yes, but then watch out that you don't compute your wrong results. We have looked into that, and then again, it's a nice property of certain algorithms to filter out inaccuracies. So if you look at the pooling function, for example, in an ANN, you see here red, the, this red coming up curve, the error probability is really shooting high. If you look at the exact values at the input of the pooling function. However, if you look at the output of this pooling function, you can see that you barely see any of that error. Right? So the relevant values you have there that come out in that pooling function, they don't have so many errors. And that then tr translate to the test accuracy that is a classic MNIST case. Yes, um, we have above 99%. We can keep that. And we show that as a function of sigma over mu here until a certain level. And then you can see that we degrade. That's the blue curve. And then the Greek curve is classic case where you adopt some noise during the training. You are more robust, so you can keep a higher level of accuracy, even if you have elevated noise levels. Another aspect, I said you can do this trade-off. You can be faster, slower trade over the accuracy. So we looked into different delay cells and their properties. So you show how the sigma over mu is changing with respect to voltage. And using those different cells, you apparently can then achieve different energy efficiency levels and throughput. So you have this trade-off. And we did that. I mean, here's no crossover point, right? You see that the energy efficiency here is really best for this one cell all the way through, right? So that is, is nice. So it's a clear winner. But however, it is, I think, important because of this many unknowns. I mean, what is really the variability systematic and random? We went to a test chip to validate that. The other aspect, I promise, is to look into how to compute, I mean, multiplication of larger numbers or adding larger numbers. We could have those many stages, but especially for multiplier, one has this idea of shift and add. It's also well known in the domain of running binary or uh, binary network, neural networks, right? So what you can do is you do a computation with a single binary value, then shift the corresponding results, and add that again in the digital domain. So this adder is just uh, summing up at the very end. It's a cheap way of doing that. Um, and then you can use a low precision in the input side, which is a nice way of resolving that 
question of having proper accuracy. Now, what falls into that is a bit plain technique well known for filter design. You have the shift and add principle, and some people like to call it also bit split as you, if you partition your bits into uh, different computational chains. Now, changing to the next slide, trying to at least. Somehow, ah, yeah, I have control again. Okay, uh, that again is, I mean, computing, well, that's another challenge if you do this kind of computation. I mean, you think of having, you compute the MSB side and you have some lower values, some inaccuracies, you don't take account for that in the other chains, then you might have a problem again with the accuracy zone, has to be a little careful about computing the MSB and the LSB side. Another interesting aspect, also again coming from the domain of artificial neural networks, is the question of what is the best way of quantizing values. We are classically used in the digital domain to do uniform quantization, right? We have like the same distance between each and every value. And I mean, this is okay, right? But I mean, what one can figure out is that if you have a non-uniform quantization, that you can live, live with a, a less number of quantization levels, right? Now, that is kind of difficult, again, to exploit in the digital domain, but in the time domain, it comes natural, right? You can adjust your delays whatever you like, right? You can have any intermediate values being realized, and that's kind of the beautiful part here. To do that in a time domain, you can see now this is the non-unique, uh, non-uniform quantization. You can see the bit precision can go lower while keeping a higher accuracy whether it's having a unique quantification quantization, you have to go to much higher bit width to get the same accuracy. Right? So it, it's again a nice trade-off that can be easily realized by again setting those delay in a way you like to have it. With that, I mean, I spoke now also about the challenges of doing such a design. I mean, the other part is the prospect. So what can you do with that? So let's look at a couple of examples. I mentioned the LDPC a couple of times. There has been other designs that, uh, I mean, worked on that as well. And there's a whole lot of other ideas that were looked into to see whether there's a benefit of going to time domain. I don't want to talk too much about LDPC. I mean, we see here once the DTC and then the blocks in between. These are very simple gates, right? We spoke about a minimum selection, arbiter function, all that. That can be very efficiently done in that I mean, time domain. That's why the LDPC has such a large benefit. I personally found the other concept interesting if you think about the time domain computation to do shortest path. Apparently one can think of setting up an array where you set the boundaries, you define that, you don't have propagation in those paths, and then the tool is capable or that hardware is capable of very efficiently finding the shortest path to the, from the input to the output side. So these are just two examples where, I mean, time domain computing is uh, can be very efficient then at the end. Looking into efficiency, let's come to my concluding slide. We have looked into analog digital domain and then said, okay, how about time domain? The question is, where is time domain con uh, located, right? If I look at the trade-off between cost and SNR, um, well, the digital has benefit if you go to large word lengths, where is time domain located? The one comparison that was done by some colleagues is, well, again, to look not SNR, but like number of bits, which is kind of equivalent. And they did the time domain mixed signal implementation and figured out for low number of bits, you can be much better in terms of energy you need compared to digital. So there seems to be a tendency again to be better than the analog domain, sorry, than the digital domain, in this case for lower word lengths. Now the question we were looking into is, I mean, how does it look now if you compare all three? So what we did is we realized all those implementations, analog, digital, or had an equivalent way of assessing their efficiency. And what came out, I mean, this is kind of a comic. We'll, we'll have that published very soon. So what we see here is the energy on the y-axis and on the x-axis, the kernel size. So if you think about Mac operations, how many Mac operations do you want to do in one shot? Now, what we can see is that the digital is more or less insensitive of the size in terms of an efficiency or the spit, right? There's no increase. Why should there be an increase at the end of the digital domain? Going for longer chains, right? So if you normalize that to the number of bits, you can see that the analog domain has a significant reduction in energy cost. That's simply because the ADC is so expensive. And what we figured out for the case we looked into is that at the end, 
for our test case, you saw that for those lower word lengths, sorry, chain lengths or number of multiply accumulation operation we wanted to do, that actually time domain performs, outperforms digital domain. This is with a, I mean, a caveat there, but it's for small and medium sized vectors. And the other one is we have to allow a little error on the LSB side, right? If you want to be as exact as a digital domain, no LSB errors whatsoever, then this doesn't hold. You have to tolerate a minor reduction in accuracy and then time domain can be a very promising solution. With that, I'd like to conclude my talk. Thank you very much. I also would like to thank the team here in Aachen, Jelou, Florian Freie, Christian Lanius and Tim Stadtmann, who had major contribution to produce uh, the results we have and the list of different papers that were used in the talk is also upcoming here. Again, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Tobias. Very nice talk. So um, I ask to all attendees that want to put questions to do the question as soon as possible here in the chat channel. So for the moment, I'm seeing no questions. So I have one. Uh, well, the first one I was <laughs> going to, to ask, you already answered a little bit uh, in your uh, final uh, remarks that uh, so one of the important results you achieve is the power reduction. No? So um, can you comment about uh, the scaling of uh, the approach? So if you want to do large system, how you can uh, manage this to to do the synthesis of uh, uh, big computing system? No? Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about larger systems, I would all, always think of this time domain computing as being a, a block that is done as a hard macro that is integrated in a larger system. And that's something I've shown in the prior slide. If you leave it completely to the EDA tools, the accuracy you get, the systematic variation that is created, even if you force EDA tools to do a great job of getting same timing and all that, it, it's not good enough, right? So that's at least what we have observed. You have to go through the step of doing a structured placement to have a very tight control on the capacitive loading and also the capacitive coupling to other wires. I mean, the loading and the coupling to other wires are two uh, crucial elements. If you don't control those, you, are, you can be so far off that, I mean, the, the, you, you won't get the accuracy probably that you would like to have, right? So we believe, again, to make it work, uh, do a structured design, make out of that a hard macro, and then you can you can integrate it in larger designs. Apparently, if you have a, a template right, of something like a delay chain, you can multiply use that, right? And that's what we did, right? We design a small part of that. We think about like a single delay element, a delay cell, like a bit cell in the memory. You spend effort in that one, and then you can paste that many, many times, right? So the design effort is not that large, right? You just have to think and work on that one delay element. The rest can more or less be automated to get to larger array sizes. Okay. So uh, one of the big challenges nowadays uh, with uh, the new nodes is the problem of the interconnections. No? So do you have some data comparing the number of connections uh, you need in a time domain computer comparing to the traditional computing systems? Yeah, in terms of wiring or routability, I mean, we didn't see really any problems, to be honest, right? I mean, why is that? Well, on the lowest level, we have very, we plan our wiring, right, on the bit cell level. And the only communication you have is bit cell to bit cell at the end, right? So there's only one wire connected to the next one and so forth. Right? There's little control here, so you have some additional wires you have to think about. But you, you really, I mean, our array in the, in the core area is 100% utilization, right? So we started to worry about adding actually decaps and stuff to make sure that we not only have our delay cells, but even that then is another interesting point. If you have digital domain and you design that, you have to worry about decap because you don't know what happens. We know what happens, right? We know that on the left-hand side, our transition starts into the array, right? And propagates through. So that means that if on the left-hand side we start, all the rest is quiet and all the gates that are there, they act as decoupling capacitance for the incoming edge. Right? So even the case of having 100% utilization, it is possible in terms of wiring on one side 
And it's also possible in terms of dynamic IR drop because you have a large area that is not active and that acts then per se as a decoupling capacitor and stabilizing your power supply. Okay, thank you. I'm seeing no questions in the chat. So if you have a question, you must do it now. And then, um, well, um, so I think I have to thank you, Professor Tobias, for this very nice talk. So it's an important point nowadays where uh, optimization is the uh, important point to, and uh, as uh, we are already talked about, uh, the reduction on power energy is becoming more and more important now. Uh, so if you don't do anything to do optimization, we are not going to have energy to run all the computing systems in the near future. Now. But it appears a question for you from Dalto Colombo. Hi, Tobias. Thank you very much for this nice uh, talking. Could you please uh, talk uh, something about data storage in the time domain and also simple applications that can benefit from this approach? Yeah. I mean, th these are two interesting questions. I mean, the first one, how to, to store something. If you talk about weights, for example, right, th those we can either store as a bistable element, being a classic flip-flop, 6T cell, or something like that. We can also, and that's what I've shown, if it's about weights, we could store them in non-volatile switching devices, assuming they could be nicely co-integrated with the, the standard cells. If you think about storing a value in the time domain, there's concepts of having a kind of a loop, right, that you close and you have the edge continuously cycling, or you could even think of stopping the signal by disconnecting the propagation path, right? If you think of having a, a chain of gates, you could have either dynamic storage, right? You just disconnect the, the propagation path and then each element would Day at the value they are, you could continue later on and the edge would be stored right at the location, that chain where you want to have it. Apparently, dynamic storage is critical if you want to do it longer. Now, the, the one possibility is have local feedback loops like you have in flip-flops that are activated to kind of keep that state of where the edge is in that chain, right? So that is a, these are two ways like the loop, loop continuously cycling or stopping the edge in a chain to do storage in the time domain, right, which is also used in some examples where people exploit that to do computations efficiently. The other aspect uh, regarding applications, I mean, I would like to, don't want to go to too many things here right now, but I would like to point you to the summary I have here. So that's all the application I have found. The references are given. So if you want to follow up and take a look at, at those, and maybe there's something you like. Uh, otherwise, I mean, send me an email. I'd, I'm happy to have some further discussion. If you tell me of what you're interested in, we could see if there's something that matches your interests. OK, so thank you very much. I'm seeing no more questions here in the chat. So thank you very much, Professor Tobia, for this very nice uh, talk in a very interesting subject.